So um, the goal for tonight is sort of to talk about shoulder issues. Um, and I definitely would like it to be as informal as it can be. I tend to wander around a little bit and I'm happy to have you stop me and ask questions and kind of direct which way things should go. I have a group of about, I don't know how many, maybe 30 slides to try to just give an overview of things. And then I have some apps on the iPad that I've kind of found over the last month or so that have pictures and x-rays and some video of surgery and we can go any direction we want to go in terms of what things you guys specifically have questions about. Um, anybody have anything specific they're hoping to learn tonight that you want to share now? No? Yeah? Uh, how to protect the shoulder. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty vulnerable joint. It is, yeah. yeah. So the, the talk as I have it set up is geared a little bit more toward the crowd that I assumed we'd have, and that's who I have. There's sort of shoulder issues can be divided by age pretty well, actually. And there's sort of some issues that people in their kind of up to young 30s tend to have, and then there's problems that the rest of us tend to have. And so I'm, most of the things that I have geared toward are, are the things that are kind of older than the young 30s or late 20s that, that tend to have. So, so I ended up here, and I actually grew up in Baltimore. I ended up here on the seacoast because I went to college in, in Hanover and uh, really loved New Hampshire and ended up sort of circling back here after a while. I went to medical school at University of Pennsylvania and then spent five years doing my residency at University of Rochester out in New York, in Rochester, New York. Then I served as an orthopedic surgeon for seven years in the Navy, um, and then uh, a year doing a fellowship in sports medicine, which is, sports medicine is taking care of athletes, but it's also um, a subspecialty that deals mostly with shoulder and knee problems and arthroscopic evaluation and treatment of shoulder and knee problems. Um, so I did a fellowship at the Hospital for Joint Diseases in New York City, and then I've been here coming on four years at this point. Um, and our group has, uh, I guess there are nine surgeons and one primary care orthopedist in our group. So to start about the shoulder, to, we'll start with doing just a little bit of anatomy and then there's actually a three-dimensional model that I have on the iPad that we'll circle back to and sort of go over all this stuff again after we get through it once. So this is looking at the shoulder blade from the front of the shoulder. So this, this here is the shoulder blade. This is the humerus, which is the upper arm bone, collarbone, and then the acromion is the top part of the uh, of the collar, I'm sorry, of the shoulder blade. Um, so the only connection between your shoulder blade, which sits on your back, and your body is through your collarbone. It's the only bony connection. The shoulder blade is held on the back just by muscle. There's no real joint there. There's only just muscle holding it in place. Um, then there's so there's sort of the three joints: is the joint between your back and your shoulder blade. That's called the scapulothoracic joint. The ball and socket joint, which is under here, is called the glenohumeral joint. And that's the joint between the ball and the socket of the shoulder joint. And then there's a joint called your AC joint, which is the joint between your collarbone and the shoulder blade. And that, as I said, is really the bony connection between your arm and your body. Um, so the design of the shoulder, we'll, we'll talk about in a second, is designed to allow you to have a tremendous amount of range of motion. Um, and so the way that you get that is about two-thirds of that motion happens through the ball and socket joint and a third of the motion happens because your shoulder blade actually moves on your back and all those muscles that help support the shoulder blade have to move it so that it's in an optimum position for your arm to do what it needs to do and for your shoulder blade to work the way it needs to go. So as you lift your arm up overhead about two-thirds of that motion comes from the ball and socket joint and about a third of the motion comes from your shoulder blade moving on your back. So in order to get all the range of motion that your shoulder has, it's a ball and socket joint that needs to have a very shallow socket and a very big ball. Unlike your hip, which is also a ball and socket joint which has a very deep cup and a very small ball, it has a lot of stability because of the bone, but your range of motion isn't anywhere near as far in your hip. You can only go about 90 degrees or so in your hip, whereas your arm can go a whole 180 degrees. So the way your shoulder does that is by having a very small cup and a very big ball. Um, 
The disadvantage, so, so it almost is like a golf ball sitting on a golf tee. And the disadvantage of that is that the shoulder is very unstable. So it doesn't have a lot of intrinsic bony stability. And so there's been a lot of adaptations that um, the body does in order to try to give the shoulder some stability. And the first of those is this thing called the glenoid labrum. And that's a soft tissue, almost rubbery um, structure that goes right around the outside of the cup of the shoulder joint. So this picture is looking straight into the cup of the shoulder joint or the glenoid. And the labrum goes all the way around the outside of it. And that labrum does a couple of things. It makes the cup a little bit bigger functionally so that the ball's more likely to stay in. It increases the depth of that cup, which is a really very shallow cup. The, the, glenoid, the labrum's what gives it that um, depth. And it gives the shoulder about an increase of about 25% of stability. But in terms of the most of what we're going to talk about tonight, the thing that's most important that the labrum does is it allows the ligaments of the shoulder a place to attach on the cup of the shoulder joint. So the next layer out from the, from the joint are these ligaments that go from the cup side out to the ball of the shoulder joint. And those ligaments are part of what holds your shoulder in place. The thing is that as you have the huge range of motion in your shoulder, if you think of the ligaments, if you think of them like my shirt, in the, my shirt now when my arm is here is wrinkled in the front. But as I reach my arm out like that, those wrinkles all come out of the shirt in the front. And now it's wrinkled in the back. And as I come forward, they're stretched. The ligaments in the back are stretched. But in the middle, where most of us do most of our motion, there's not a whole lot of stability from those ligaments. The, the shirt is sort of wrinkled all the way around. It doesn't have any tight structure to hold it in place. Um, so those structures are, are important, again, at the extremes of motion, but not um, at the, at, in the middle motion where we do most of what we do. And this just shows, again, that all these different named ligaments, there's a whole bunch of named ligaments, but basically all of them are the lining around the shoulder joint, and they attach into this labrum around the cup of the shoulder joint. So another structure to point out that's going to come in as an important place that people can get pain is the biceps tendon. So your biceps muscle in the front of your arm has two parts to it, which is why it's biceps. And one part comes up, and it's not shown here, but one part splits and it comes and attaches to this thing called the coracoid up in front of the shoulder blade. And the second part comes up and goes through a little groove on the humerus right in the front and then attaches actually inside the shoulder joint. And because of the way this tendon goes up into the shoulder joint through a very tight little groove, it can get a lot of inflammation around that tight little groove and actually can end up fraying and tearing. And I have some pictures of that. So that can be a pretty significant area of um, pain in the shoulder. And certainly, as the shoulder becomes more degenerative, that can be true. So then the final layer out is the rotator cuff muscles. Okay, And the rotator cuff is literally a group of muscles. Um, there's four of them. And they start on the shoulder blade, both on the front and the back of the shoulder blade. And they come out and they attach to the ball of the shoulder joint. So to look at a model, if this, is, if this is the shoulder blade, this is the humerus, which is the upper arm bone, those muscles all start on your shoulder blade and they come and they attach in a cuff out here on your upper arm bone. So they go from muscle to tendon and they attach out here. And their job is basically to pull like muscles pull. And as they do, they pull the ball right into the cup and keep it stable. So during the majority of your motion, it's just that muscle of your rotator cuff that's holding your the ball stable. Um, and that's their, that's their biggest part of their job. We'll talk as we go on about some of the other things that that does. Um, so I have some just two little sort of plastic models here that I can pass around to take a look at how all that goes. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be worth trying to switch the, switch the iPad for a second here. So this is a three-dimensional model of the shoulder here. Is that coming up? Yeah. Um, and if we start just looking just at the bone, again, here's the, here's the cup of the, I mean, the ball of the shoulder joint 
and the cup of the shoulder joint. And on the ball and on the cup is this white layer of cartilage. That's the smooth surface that allows the joint to glide nicely. Then there's the shoulder blade. This is the core cord where the biceps attaches. And then this is the um, clavicle, the collarbone, and then the acromion, which is that top part of the shoulder blade. And as you can see, as, as you lift your arm up, as we start to lift the arm up, the first about two-thirds of that motion comes between the ball and the socket of the shoulder. And then as we get a little bit higher, the shoulder blade has to move on the back in order to let the arm go up. So the first part of the motion is all in the ball and socket. The second part of the motion is a combination of ball and socket and the shoulder blade moving on the back. And that becomes important in terms of the things you can do to rehab your shoulder and keep your shoulder so that it's happy. The next layer is those ligaments and then the rotator cuff muscle. And what you can see is that the rotator cuff muscle again, and this shows the biceps too. So the rotator cuff muscle, this is the front muscle of the rotator cuff, the top one, which is the one that's most commonly injured called the supraspinatus, and then there's two on the back. This is that biceps tendon that comes up and goes under this ligament in this little groove where it can get injured. And then this is the second part of the biceps that comes over to there. And the thing to notice, well, first of all, so there's two muscles back on the back of the rotator cuff. There's that one on the top and the one on the front. So then the thing to notice is to look at what happens as I move this thing and raise the arm again. Look what happens right in this area where the acromion, which is the bone that sits on top, and the rotator cuff underneath. So as you start to lift your arm up, you start to lift your arm up, that muscle rubs right underneath that bone, the acromion bone. And there's a bursa that lives between those two things. And a bursa is anywhere where there's two layers of tissue that have to slide relative to one another, there's a thing called a bursa, which is a lubricating layer and has some fluid in it. So there's a bursa that isn't shown on this that's actually between that rotator cuff and the acromion. But the tendency is that you're, as you lift your arm up, that shoulder blade, I mean, sorry, that uh, rotator cuff rubs there. Um, and then outside of that is your deltoid and all the bigger muscles around your shoulder. So is that, is that a helpful model? It seems, like it seems like it was good for me. All right, so there's a whole host of reasons that people can get shoulder pain. And as we talked about, some of them are for younger people. It happen in younger people. Some of them happen in older people. And most of us sort of think when you get shoulder, get pain in your joints, everybody sort of thinks, oh, well, I have arthritis. And a lot of people are told that they have arthritis. But arthritis in the shoulder joint is actually pretty uncommon. Um, but there's two main joints that can get arthritis. The, remember, there's three joints in the shoulder, but the one between your shoulder blade and your body doesn't really have cartilage, so it can't get arthritis. But you can get arthritis in that collarbone joint between your collarbone and your acromion, and you can get arthritis in the ball and socket joint or the glenohumeral joint. Then there's ligament problems and tears of that labrum that go around the cup of the shoulder joint. And these are much more of an issue in young athletes, so 20-year-old, 18-year-old people that are dislocating their shoulder playing sports, those sorts of things. Where it's important, um, and th those things can obviously happen in older people, but are usually if you dislocate your shoulder once you're older than about 35, it isn't that big a deal. When you dislocate your shoulder in your 20s, it is a big deal and can give you much longer problems. So adhesive capsulitis we'll talk about is something that's actually very common um, in sort of 50s and older, and that's frozen shoulder or stiffness of the shoulder, and we'll talk about how that happens. And then muscle and tendon problems, and th that's rotator cuff tendonitis, rotator cuff disease, and then biceps tendonitis, like we talked about, where that biceps goes through that groove. Anybody have any questions at this point? Yeah? yeah. Well, that's, that's coming right up. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So rotator cuff, again, comes right underneath this acromion. Where those bone spurs would be is up on the front of this acromion. So if you look at this rotator cuff coming out from underneath the acromion bone, this is the one that tends to have trouble with not having enough space. So the things about the rotator cuff that are important is that the blood supply in this area of the tendon, which is the area that rubs right underneath that acromion bone, isn't very good at baseline. And as you get older and your circulation gets less ideal, the blood supply in that little watershed area of the tendon is even more compromised. So when you're young, people don't tend to get rotator cuff problems except for pitchers and people that are doing a lot of throwing and putting a tremendous amount of demand on their rotator cuff. And the reason is that your body can heal your rotator cuff. 
So you put the, you use it and your body heals it and sort of keeps up with it. And as you get older and your circulation isn't quite as good in that area of the rotator cuff, you use it and your body doesn't keep up as well as you'd like it to in terms of healing it. And so slowly that area of the rotator cuff can break down. So, again, so, so its ability to heal just from normal use is diminished. So rotator cuff disease, there's kind of, I think of it as one long spectrum of, of disease and it's all sort of have similar symptoms and similar treatment, although within that there are a bunch of different things that we sort of think of as individual entities. And this oftentimes is confusing for patients because they come in and I say, well, you have rotator cuff tendonitis. And they say, well, but my primary care doctor told me I have bursitis and their, and their physical therapist told them they have impingement. And really, we're all talking about more or less the same disease, the same thing. So, so, but these are basically the five different rotator cuff things that we'll talk about, the, the, the specific entities about the rotator cuff. So rotator cuff symptoms, your rotator cuff lives on your shoulder blade back in here, but where people feel that pain is almost always here. So actually the first patient I saw as a resident in training when I um, you know, was, was learning, I was called to see a patient in the hospital that had horrible pain right here. And I examined her and talked to her and spent half an hour with her. And I went down and I talked to the attending, the teacher level person. I said, I think she has deltoid problem. And the guy just laughed at me and he said, no, rotator cuff. And it really is true that where people complain about their rotator cuff is here. Um, so people tend to have pain with activity and that activity is typically reaching overhead, getting glasses out of a cupboard, getting, doing things that are sort of up here and reaching behind their back. So guys talk about getting their wallet out. Women talk about snapping their bra. It ends up being painful to reach back behind. Um, and then weakness, and people, as rotator cuff disease gets worse and worse and worse, um, initially you have weakness because of pain around your shoulder, and then as time goes on, you have weakness because the rotator cuff isn't attached, and so it doesn't lift your arm up very well. Yeah? It also says uh, pain would have to be in at night. Why yep. is that? Don't know. I forgot to say that out loud. That you're, you're right. That, that, and that's, that, that is the most common... So what people, people come in, they say, the, mo the, the sort of classic story for rotator cuff pain is it hurts here, I can't sleep on that side, and then over time it gets so it's not only can't they sleep on that side, they just can't sleep. And, um, and it hurts reaching up and behind back. I don't know why it hurts more at night, but it does. That's sort of a classic finding. I don't know why that is. I mean, I, I, a lot of pain hurts more at night because that's when you kind of stop doing what you do in the day and you are lying in bed and you can focus on the fact that it hurts. Right. Um, but I think there might be something more to it than that with the rotator cuff because it's really true that people really say it hurts at night. And that's when it hurts. Okay, so impingement is the first thing. And that's what we talked about where the rotator cuff rubs up underneath that bone. And that's worse if there's bone spurs up here in the front of that acromion bone because there's less space in that what we call the outlet for the rotator cuff tendon to come through and it just rubs, it just chafes right on there. Um, I'm trying to think when the easiest time to sort of talk about how that, well, we can talk about it as we go on. So bursitis is a similar kind of situation where your rotator cuff is rubbing and that bursa between the rotator cuff and that bone gets inflamed and irritated and those two things are more or less you know, similar, more or less, um, you can talk about them as being the same issue. And then there's tendonitis. So if you keep rubbing that rotator cuff up underneath that bone, eventually the tendon gets irritated. And because the blood supply isn't as good there, your body doesn't do as good a job of healing it. And that tendon eventually breaks down. So your rotator cuff, we talked about that the first job of your rotator cuff is to hold the ball into the socket. The second job of your rotator cuff has to do with moving your arm, so moving your arm in and out. But they're actually relatively small muscles. There are big, bigger muscles that do a lot of the movement of your arm. And the biggest muscle is your deltoid, your big, big muscle here on your shoulder. And it's not shown in this picture, but if your deltoid were here, it starts on this bone up here on your acromion, and it comes down and attaches down here on your humerus. So when you go to lift your arm, your deltoid starts to pull up on your arm. And it pulls 
basically at this angle. So the first thing it tries to do is pull the ball of your shoulder joint directly up against that acromion. And if you look at the models that are passed around, they really, that acromion is just sitting right up on top. It's the, it's the fulcrum if you, if you just have your deltoid lift up. But if you look at the way that the angle is on the bottom muscles of your rotator cuff, the front and the back muscles, it, they actually pull the ball of the shoulder joint down. So as you go to lift your arm up, as your deltoid pulls up, your rotator cuff pulls down. And if it's not doing that efficiently, it allows the ball of the, hum the, ball of the humerus to bang up against that acromion, and that causes more problem with your rotator cuff. So you end up in this spiral where your rotator cuff isn't working as well as it should, so it doesn't hold the ball down as you go to lift your arm up. And then because it's not working as well as it should, the rotator cuff gets more irritated because it's banging up against that bone. And then it hurts more and so it doesn't work as well and you end up in this sort of downward spiral where things just keep getting worse and worse. Or can keep getting worse and worse unless you do something to change it. And as we'll talk about as time goes on, the thing that's probably most important to change, your, to change that is to strengthen the front and back muscles of your rotator cuff, your infraspinatus and your subscapularis, which is the front one, in order so that they can hold that ball down. Um, the second part of it is, if you think back to the video, the three-dimensional video that I showed that shows your, your shoulder blade moving on your back, as you start to lift your arm up, if your shoulder blade doesn't move to get out of the way, there's even going to be more opportunity for this to bang against that bone. But just about the point where it starts to want to bang, your shoulder blade moves out of the way. So the other thing that's really important in terms of keeping your rotator cuff happy and treating rotator cuff problems once you have them is to strengthen all those muscles that support your shoulder blade. Because if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, the shoulder blade doesn't get out of its own way and you beat up your rotator cuff. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so about a year ago, I was Mm-hmm. To feel better. So, so she's saying that she was, when she was lifting up overhead like this, the shoulder felt as if it popped out and then hurt for, for a number of months. Um, that is, it's hard to know exactly what happened, but people, your shoulder can, I mean, there's enough mobility of the ball that it's totally possible that the shoulder slid out of place. Um, and, and that's because the rotator cuff wasn't doing quite as good a job of holding it in place as it might have. And it, there, are so, there are certain positions where it's more vulnerable than others. Um, but then you probably ended up in a situation where your rotator cuff was irritated from that one episode and then it just took a while to get it strengthened back up and get out of that cycle. So treatment, when you, once your rotator cuff is irritated, up until the point where it's torn, is physical therapy and it does the strengthening things that we talked about. Anti-inflammatory medicines to try to decrease the inflammation in that bursa. Interestingly, most of the things that we use anti-inflammatory medicines like Motrin and Naproxen for really don't have any inflammation associated with them. The bursa around the shoulder has actually been shown to be inflamed. And so anti-inflammatories really work well. Cortisone injections, which is, an anti, again, an anti-inflammatory injection into that bursa to try to help quiet it down. And then sometimes we'll, we'll show some pictures that show a bone spur. Sometimes we end up doing surgery to smooth off that bone spur and give the rotator cuff some more room. So, some, so calcific tendinitis is, is, ten, is irritation of that tendon where sometimes people's bodies respond to that irritation by laying down calcium in the tendon, on or in the tendon. And then that calcium, it's another one of these feedback things where the calcium then causes an irritation in the tendon and you end up laying down more calcium. And so that's something that can oftentimes can come on relatively abruptly, can be really painful relatively abruptly. And sometimes it's not as easy as it could be to deal with. You can get do, sometimes get it to go away with injections and anti-inflammatory, but all too often we end up having to go in and surgically take that calcium out. And if it's been there too long, it actually starts replacing the tendon. So when we end up taking the calcium out, there's a hole in the tendon that we then have to repair. That's something that's usually visible on x-ray. So again, you can, 
you can um, exercise, you can do anti-inflammatories, dry needling. So this calcium usually, it can eventually get hard, but it's usually the, the consistency of toothpaste. So you can actually sort of take a needle and poke it sometimes and get it to float away, and, and you can do that under ultrasound guidance. You have to do it a little, be a little bit careful with that because if it's too big an area of calcium and you get it to go away, you leave a hole behind. Um, you leave a hole behind. I mean, the calcium goes away, but then if there was a hole in the tendon, now there's a hole in the tendon that really sort of needs to be repaired. That's a procedure. In our office, my partner, Dr. Brennan, is very good with the ultrasound machine. So in our office, um, I send people to him, and he does that. He can look with the ultrasound probe. He can see the area of calcium and just take a needle and poke some holes in it. And very often, it works very well. You just, it just sometimes it ends up leaving a hole behind. So then the, the kind of end game of rotator cuff disease is a rotator cuff tear, and that tear is out here at the far edge of the, usually, out here at the far edge of the supraspinatus tendon, and it's right where it attaches into the bone, typically, and that's that area where the, where the blood supply isn't as good. And it literally is a hole in the, in the muscle, or in the tendon, where it attaches into the bone. And, it, and the tears can be anywhere from a very small tear involving one tendon to involving all of the tendons of the rotator cuff. It can spread all the way back here, and it can come all the way down the front. So sometimes the rot so when you hear people say, oh, well, I had my rotator cuff repaired, sometimes that's, they had one little part of their rotator cuff repaired, and sometimes it's, they had three of the four muscles repaired. And so the outcomes that pe people often come in and say, oh, well, my Aunt Matilda had rotator cuff repair and it didn't go so well. Well, might be that she had a humongous tear and, this, you know, and you have a small tear. So it's not easy to predict necessarily. Yeah? How do you do the repairs? So let me get, I'll get there in one second. Actually, some video of that too. So, so this can be caused by a single traumatic event. That's relatively uncommon, actually, but it can be that you have a little bit of tendonitis, the rotator cuff's a little bit irritated, and then you fall and it just tears. More commonly, it's just overuse over a period of time. So studies that were done 30 or so years ago looking at people that donated their body to science, looking at cadavers and looking at the incidence of rotator cuff tears have shown that as many as 40% 40, 40 of people might have rotator cuff tears. And they aren't symptomatic. A lot of those people aren't symptomatic. Um, the incidence increases with age. And I can't remember exactly the numbers, but the, you know, the papers showed sort of how many people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. But by the time you're 80, 90, really probably the majority of people have a tear of their rotator cuff that's not symptomatic. So what's funny is that rotator cuff tears can be extremely symptomatic and extremely painful and extremely problematic. And sometimes you don't even know you had them. So it's a little bit of a art to try to sort out what, which ones are causing pain, which ones aren't causing pain, and which ones need to be repaired. The tradition was, when I finished my training in 2000, if um, when I took my boards, the answer was that you had to have somebody do six months of physical therapy, and you had to do a whole bunch of injections before you considered repairing their rotator cuff. Um, and the rationale was that if there are all these people walking around with a rotator cuff that doesn't hurt, with a rotator cuff tear that doesn't hurt, if we can make you back into one of those people, good enough, you don't need surgery. And there's some truth to that, but there have been over time studies that have shown that 40% of these tears are going to continue to get bigger. And other studies have shown that the bigger the tear is at the time that you repair it, the less likely it is to actually heal. And other studies have shown that of the tears that are getting bigger, the majority of those are going to be symptomatic. So over the last sort of 10 or 12 years, rotator cuff repairs, which used to be done through a great big incision back when I finished my residency in 2000, are now done through the scope, which makes them much less invasive. And we've started to understand that rotator cuff repairs can get bigger, can progress. So I think, that mo I think it's fair to say that most orthopedic surgeons have gotten more aggressive about fixing rotator cuffs than they used to have. Oh, the, the other thing is that injections, a couple injections to settle down inflammation in the shoulder are fine. But there have been studies that have shown if you have repeated injections, the likelihood that your repair heals goes down. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just going yeah. Too many injections aren't good. Too many injections aren't good. One or two injections is probably fine, but too many injections, not good. Um, so again, it's typically arthroscopic. Sometimes we end up opening them. And for me, I end up making an incision if the front muscle is torn or if all of the front muscle is torn, I make an incision. Otherwise, pretty much do it through the, through the scope. So I have some video of this later, but this is just a quick picture of what a rotator cuff repair might look like. We put basically 
this part is torn away from the bone. And what we do is we put these anchors down into the bone. And there are several different designs of the anchors. Some look like a screw. Some look like a knot. Some, there are a bunch of different ones. But the idea basically is it's some way to anchor a stitch to the bone. And then you pass the stitch up through the tendon and tie the tendon back down to the bone. The trick then is once we've tied it back down to the bone, your body has to heal it back to the bone. So it's the, that stitch won't last forever. It, so if it doesn't get healed, so it's stuck back to the bone within some period of weeks, the stitches will just chafe their way through and then the whole thing fails. So the studies that have sort of prospectively looked at the likelihood of the tendon healing have shown that it depends on the size of the tendon. It also, the size of the tear, it also depends on whether you smoke. Smoking um, dramatically increases the likelihood that it won't heal. Um, and then comorbidities like diabetes and some things like that can decrease the likelihood that it heals. And age, the older you are because of the blood supply issues and those kinds of things, it's, it's less likely to heal. So will you talk a little bit about how aggressive uh, therapy following a procedure like this? Yep. So we can talk about that now. So after, after a rotator cuff repair, which is tying this down, the most important thing that, I don't want people, that we don't want people to do is to lift their arm up. So if you use your deltoid lifts your arm up, but this top muscle lifts your arm up some too. So if you go to lift your arm up before it heals, you're just pulling this tendon right against those stitches and the stitches can pull right out. So for the first six weeks or so, you're just in a sling. And sometimes you probably have seen people walking around with a sling that has a little pillow underneath it. There's been some studies that have shown that using the pillow um, makes it so that the blood supply to the tendon is a little bit better. I use it in tendons where I had some trouble getting it back over to where it needed to be attached, where it was a little bit tight. And so if you put the arm up like this, it takes tension off the rotator cuff. And it's usually about three weeks on the pillow and then three weeks in the normal sling. And then at six weeks, we let people start using their arm, somewhere around five, six, seven weeks in that range. Um, at that point, we used to start strengthening the rotator cuff, but more recent studies have shown that the reconnection to the bone is to some extent established at six weeks, but it's not as strong as it will be until 12 weeks or later. So most protocols don't start doing strengthening of the rotator cuff until about three months after the surgery. And it's about six months before you're back to doing any significant overhead heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There have been a lot of studies looking at stem cell injections, and so far none of them have shown any benefit. Well, let me go back. There. Let me go back. PRP, which was, so there's stem cell injections, and then there's this spun down plasma, which was sort of a hot topic about three years ago, four years ago. The studies that have looked at PRP have not shown any benefit. I don't know what stem cell studies there have been. So, uh, so, I may, so there may be stem cell studies. But the problem with this is that you'll see when we look at some video is that you pump water into the shoulder when you do the arthroscopy bit. So you have, in order to put whatever you put in there, plasma or stem cells or something, it's an issue of how do you keep them there. So even if they were effective, which hasn't been shown yet, how do you get it to stay there so it's actually in the place you want it to be? It ends up just sort of floating away. And when I did my fellowship in New York, we were trying the PRP stuff, and it ends up looking like a little ball of jelly. And you try to put it on the stitches to get it to go in there, and it just kind of floated away. So, but so far, the studies, there's, been, there's a lot of interest in that, but so far, the studies haven't shown a whole lot of benefit. Um, so this we've already talked about. Yeah? You're to this point here, but I have a question way back when you're diagnosed Great. with the problem might be. Mm -hmm. um, is the only way for them to see whether or not you have um, a tear is through uh, uh, MRI? Okay. So I'll tell you what I typically do if you came to me and you had shoulder pain that I thought was rotator cuff disease. Rotator cuff disease, I mean, the history is usually pretty classic, as we've talked about. The exam is pretty classic as well. So the things that hurt when you have rotator cuff disease is this motion tends to hurt because it brings that rotator cuff up underneath that bone and makes it rub. And so if it's inflamed around the cuff or the bursa, that tends to hurt. That's called Hawkins test. There's another one that's called Near's test, designed by Dr. Near, which basically, if you force somebody's shoulder all the way up here, it hurts. And what that's doing is forcing the rotator cuff 
up against the acromion in the same way because the shoulder blade's not getting quite far enough out of the way. So those two things just push the rotator cuff against the bone, it hurts. And then what we do is we test strength. So the rotator cuff, we think the supraspinatus, sort of the best test for it is up here. That's the top muscle of the rotator cuff. So if people are significantly weak lifting their arm, if you have a big tear, you can't hold your arm up. It just comes right back down. So I can lift your arm up and let go and the arm just goes whoosh. That's called a drop arm sign. But you get a sense from how strong somebody is, whether they're torn. Then typically, if, if they don't have a drop arm, what most of us will then do is consider a cortisone injection. And when we do that cortisone injection, we mix it with numbing medicine, with lidocaine and marcaine, which are numbing medicines. And so if I, numb, if I put numbing medicine and cortisone in that bursa around your rotator cuff, and I take the pain from the bursitis away, I can then re-examine you. And at that point, if you have pretty reasonable strength when it doesn't hurt, I don't know for sure that you don't have a rotator cuff tear, but I know for sure you don't have a rotator cuff tear that needs to get fixed immediately. So then you go off to therapy, and then at therapy, you work on strengthening that rotator cuff so that it's not banging as much. And over that period, and then I usually see people back about six weeks later after they've had a time to strengthen. And at that point, if they're making clear progress in therapy, the injection helped, they're making clear progress in therapy, a lot of people are just better at that point. They never need anything more. Did you ever go to the therapy before you had the injection? Sure, you could do that too. The, the, the injection does two things. It helps diagnostically because I can measure your strength and I can see whether the pain went away with that injection. So it helps diagnostically. And the other thing that I think it does is a lot of what's important to therapy, as we talked about, is strengthening the rotator cuff. And if your shoulder hurts like crazy, it's hard to do that strengthening. So if I can give, so what I always tell people is I'm gonna give you this cortisone shot. It's not what's fixing your shoulder. It may make it feel better, but what's gonna fix your shoulder is you strengthening your shoulder. So, so I think that the, the cortisone shot helps people's shoulders quiet, quiet down enough that they can do something meaningful in therapy. Then when you come back at that, you come back at that six week mark, or if it's really just killing you and you don't make it the six weeks, then I think you should get an MRI scan and take a look and say, well, geez, maybe there's a tear there or something. But, but for me, unless, unless it's pretty clear on my initial exam that you've got a tear, I don't get an MRI scan right away because it's not gonna change what I'm gonna do. I still think that you're gonna go to therapy and try an injection and those kinds of things. So, and then I think, I mean, in this day and age, I think there are not very many patients going to surgery for rotator cuff disease that have not had an MRI scan. You can, you can argue from a cost perspective whether that's reasonable or not. I mean, can you see much on the x-ray? No, no, you really can't. So with all that being said, and so if the individual, say they do have a small tear, and as you said, you know, they can mm -hmm. go to therapy and strengthen mm -hmm. all of the musculature and be relatively free and go forward. So through all therapy, I mean, what is the, well, depending on what the tear is, if it's still there, could you say like, the tear's years, still there. they get bigger, and the names, and then we'll get some time. So does, do you think it heals throughout that therapy? Probably, no, it doesn't, it doesn't heal. I think what happens is, what happens is that those, those muscles in the front and the back of the rotator cuff are getting stronger. The muscles that keep your shoulder blade moving are getting stronger. And so the mechanics of the shoulder are working the way they're supposed to. And so it doesn't hurt as much. The tear's there. Right, the tear's there, it doesn't heal. And so there's, so there's an art to that too, right? I mean, if you came in and you had a reasonable size rotator cuff tear, I'd probably say, geez, we ought to fix this. If you were 85 and you came in and you have a rotator cuff tear, I'd probably say, mm, you know, if we can get you comfortable, that's great. So, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of figuring out what what is important to to the specific patient on anyone. So, biceps tendonitis, um, again, pain where the biceps goes up through this groove, and it's right under the rotator cuff too. So, it can sort of get inflamed at the same time the rotator cuff gets inflamed. All right, adhesive capsulitis. That's frozen shoulder, and that's the ligaments that we talked about around the shoulder getting tight and basically they get inflamed and they shrink and when they shrink just like if my shirt shrinks here now I can't move my arm and so this is most common in women in their 50s and 60s although it can be in anybody and it can happen either as a primary thing where just all of a sudden your shoulder gets inflamed and gets stiff and hurts or it can happen as a secondary thing where you fall on your shoulder or you're lifting weights and your shoulder starts to hurt and you stop moving it because it hurts and then because you stop moving it the ligaments get tight and then it starts to hurt because the ligaments are tight. So 
Um, either one of those things can cause adhesive capsulitis. It can give you trouble. And then diabetes, hypothyroidism, there's some other, some other things that can predispose you to it. But most of it that we see is either people that have hurt their shoulder or just people where it comes out of the blue. Um, so it's usually a dull ache, a loss of range of motion. And the thing that's interesting about frozen shoulder is that it tends to be an 18 month to two year process. And at the beginning, it's really painful. The shoulder gets stiffer and stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. And then you have a period of time where it's just frozen. And it doesn't hurt all that much, but you just can't move it. And, there can, and I've seen people that, you know, this is as far as they can get their shoulder to go. And if you wait it out, it almost always goes away and gets better. Um, people 20 years ago were more willing to wait it out than people are now. Um, so therapy doesn't help that there, there's, there's some evidence that therapy might hurt because if you, really push to stretch it, you might get that ligament more inflamed and then it tightens up more. So stretching is important and a good therapist I think can help you stretch in a way that doesn't over inflame it. But poorly done therapy clearly makes it worse. So, so what I tend to do with this is either is sort of get a sense of whether people prefer to go to therapy or do sort of stretching and strength stretching on their own and then you slowly stretch it out. There's some evidence that a cortisone injection inside the ball and socket joint in the glenohumeral joint can help decrease the inflammation. And I've actually had pretty good success with that or having Dr. Brennan do that. So with this, I tend to sort of either start, similar to the other, start with an injection and therapy and exercises or just start with exercises and then think about it later with therapy. But this is, a, this is oftentimes a hard thing, trying to figure out whether you wait it out or whether you do, do something about it. And the things you can do about it, you can put somebody to sleep and just push on their arm and tear all those ligaments. Um, and you can actually go in surgically, surgically and cut all the ligaments. Um, so neither of those are very easy. Yeah. Uh, does uh, exercise and stretch and help uh, get blood into that area? I don't know. I mean, it certainly certainly helps to have all those muscles as strong as they can be. It certainly helps to keep things stretched out. Um, I think probably your circulation is better in general if you're more active and more healthy. But you know, the extent to which it makes that one little area which, is, which has decreased blood supply in general, more blood supply, I don't know. I certainly think it's got to be helpful. Um, OK, so then just quickly arthritis. So we talked about that the ball and socket joint, the glenohumeral joint, can have arthritis. And what arthritis is, is really the loss of that cartilage surface, the smooth surface of the joint. Um, if you end up with arthritis in your shoulder, fortunately it's relatively uncommon. Um, and um, that oftentimes ends up being a shoulder, needing a shoulder replacement where the ball and socket are actually replaced. And there are a couple different types, that's kind of beyond what I was planning to talk about tonight, but there are a couple different types of shoulder replacements. One called a reverse shoulder replacement and one called a standard shoulder replacement. And they, well, the reverse is good for people that have rotator cuff tears and arthritis, and the regular one is good for people that have just straight arthritis. And their rotator cuff's in reasonably good shape. And then the collarbone joint, the AC joint, um, that's a pretty common place for people to get arthritis and pain. And that's, on x-ray, almost everybody by their mid-40s has a pretty abnormal looking AC joint. Fortunately for most people, it doesn't hurt. Um, and that in young people, you can get problems there. Weightlifters sometimes get problems at their AC joint. Um, but sometimes that's, that's part of what causes pain as, as your, uh, that's part of what causes pain um, in a sort of constellation of things in the shoulder. Questions? So now what I was planning on doing is using that same, um, using that same program that I had pulled up before. And uh, don't tell anybody my code. Um, so um, if we start with, um, well, let's start, let's start with just, um, actually, this is a better place. OK, 
Okay, so if we start with, um, this is this pre-patellar bursitis. So, um, so what this is showing is a section, it's, it's not a real section, but section through the body which shows this is the humerus, the, the ball and socket joint. This is the deltoid, the big muscle out there is the deltoid. And then this up here is the top muscle of the rotator cuff. You can see it comes over and it attaches right on this little place right here. And then the bursa is up above that um, with bone in it. And what happens in, with this is that that bursa up there gets inflamed and irritated. And that's what we talked about. You can see it's a pretty big bursa. And you can see how if this were to move up there, it would be sore. So this shows that bursa just as you lift that arm up, just pinches right up under there under the acromion. And the th again, you can see how um, if you could do something to keep this ball down, it wouldn't impinge there as much. And that's why that strengthening is important. And the second part is if, if you can get the, sh the muscles around your shoulder blades so that this goes more up and out of the way, then it's going to be less likely to pinch. So that is basically either bursitis or impingement. I think those are more or less the same thing. Um, So when we look at an x-ray of the shoulder, this is the ball and socket joint here. So here's the humerus. This is the glenoid, which is the cup. This is that acromion where the rotator cuff, the rotator cuff lives right in here. And then up at the top where the little red light is blinking is the collarbone joint. That's that AC joint. And there's bone spurs here. There's bone spur down underneath it. Bone spurs up on top. And that's arthritis in that collarbone joint. So the bone spur underneath here can push down on the rotator cuff, but bone spurs underneath that collarbone joint can also push down against the rotator cuff. And by closing down that space that's available for the rotator cuff, it's more likely to get impinged. So this is an MRI scan. And an MRI scan um, is basically as if you get put in a meat slicer. So it's the same thing as that section that I showed. And it takes sections of you from front to back and from side to side and from top to bottom. So this is one as if you're looking from the front. This is the ball of the shoulder joint, the cup of the shoulder joint. This is the rotator cuff right here. And then this white is all the fluid in that bursa. That's that irritated bursa. So that person has exactly what we talked about. And, that, and anything that pinches that is going to cause pain. So do you guys want to see video? Anybody not want to see video? So this is, this is looking inside the shoulder, well, not inside the shoulder joint, but underneath that acromion. So outside the rotator cuff, underneath that acromion in the bursa. In a normal shoulder, when you stick the scope in here, this is an open space. You can look around. You can see in there. There's not a bunch of stuff like this. Um, and what he's got is a little shaver that has a little rotating blade and has suction attached to it. And all that tissue, all that inflamed tissue just gets sucked into that shaver. So we use a combination of a shaver that does that sort of thing and uh, this thing which I can pass around which is a, uh, a little um, wand that actually helps almost melt some of that tissue so it stops it from bleeding at the same time that it sort of makes it go away. Um, is this, is this, uh, so it, what's that? It, no, it's just electricity. So it's like a bipolar electricity thing. So the normal rotator cuff, this is sort of looking down at normal rotator cuff. And this you, can see, this, you can sort of see that there's space. You can see his instruments all the way around. And then this tissue down here is the rotator cuff. So they're moving it back and forth. And it is completely intact. You can't see through it anywhere. This up there is the undersurface of the acromion bone that things bang on. And you can see that it's kind of frayed there because the rotator cuff from here was banging up into this. Does that make sense? So as that happens, you end up with inflammation and it ends up looking more like what that last video looked like. Is it common for the inflammation to go into your neck as well? Well, it probably doesn't cause arthritis in your neck, but it's very com it's common for that pain to kind of work its way up your trapezius and sort of hurt up into your neck for sure. So people oftentimes have pain that kind of here. Um, so then that calcific tendonitis that we were talking about, here's an x-ray of it. And where that blinking red light is, you can see, maybe, I don't know whether you can see it on this. There's a little sort of little area of calcium right there. Is that visible? 
not so sure it is. Maybe it's better. Oh, here, it's better on this one. So there you can see a great big piece of calcium right where that red light's blinking. And that's all just calcium that's in the rotator cuff, in and around the rotator cuff. Yeah, it's kind of toothpastey. What it ends up looking like, well, here's a, this is a still picture of it. So this is looking through the scope. This is the tendon is down here. This stuff is the calcium. And you can see this is a partial tear of the rotator cuff. So remember, I don't know if you can, how easy it is to tell the difference. I've looked at more of these, obviously, than you have. But the, the last one, you could see this was sort of a nice, smooth, white layer of tissue. Here, this is, this is kind of irritated. And then there's a, there's a video. Um, so this is this. Um, oh, let me blow it up. So this, right now he's taken out all that bursa, inflamed bursa. But then this white stuff right here is calcium from the calcific tendonitis, and it it it's just it's it's almost just sort of thick, gooey stuff. It just sucks right into that shaver. But but you can sort of see as he takes that out, there's a hole there. And it's getting more and more clear. This, this spot right here as he raises up and down is a hole in the rotator cuff. So this is now no longer attached to the bone that's down underneath. So this is the calcium making it attached? No, the calcium, the calcium is repla re replaces the tendon. So the tendon should be attached down to the bone, but it gets replaced by calcium. So the calcium doesn't have any strength. It's not bone. It's just, it's just there. So... Um, are you then more susceptible to getting a tear? Well, that, is, that, yeah, I mean, that basically, in this case, it basically is a tear. So, well, it ends up blurry. There's a, there, there's a better video, but this right here is the tear. This is a blurry section, but that right there is the tissue that should be attached down to this bone. But when the calcium all came out, it leaves a hole. Okay. That hole. Procedures, yeah. how long is Well, that, what, that, I mean, that is a tear. So they put stitches in it and repaired it. I mean, that hole ended up needing to be repaired as if it, I mean, it is a rotator cuff tear. So if, do they ever go in and, and take out the other, the substances rather than, or is that just part of it? Yes, yeah, so what we do is go in and take out the calcium. Well, sometimes we just do the needles like we talked about. You may not have been here, but some, so, so when you have that calcific tendonitis, we can go in and we can remove the calcium. If it's on the surface of the tendon, we can just take it out, and that's all we need to do. But if it's in the tendon, when you take it out, then it leaves a hole in the tendon that needs to be repaired. And you can see that by the procedure done with the ultrasound? Um, when they do the ultrasound, you see the calcium go away, right. but then it isn't clear necessarily how much tendon's left there. So, oh, so wait, so let's just, so let's look at, well, let's stay with this. So rotator cuff tear. So the rotator cuff tear, again, is right where the rotator cuff attaches into the bone, okay? So when we look at the MRI, this is like that MRI we looked at before. This is the edge of the bone where the rotator cuff is supposed to be. White is fluid. This is the end of the rotator cuff, and it's no longer attached. There's white fluid between where the rotator cuff should be and where the edge of the bone is. Um, and over time, when the rotator cuff tears get really big, this is now the edge of the tendon. It's not all, it should be all the way over here. And once the tendon, once the rotator cuff has a tear this big, it's not doing its job of holding the ball down anymore. And so you can see here that the ball is sitting right up against the acromion because there's no muscle holding it from going up there. So then this, here's a scope picture of it. So we're now looking in straight like this. This is the cup of the shoulder joint. This is the ball of the shoulder joint. This is the rotator cuff. And that tissue up there should be attached right here. You shouldn't be able to see into that open cave there. Yeah, that's a big tear. So then this is, so here are the anchors going into the bone. So right here are anchors that are screwed into the bone. And the anchors look like this. I'll pass it around. It's basically a little screw. This one's made out of plastic. 
and it has a little eyelet with two stitches attached to it. And then we can screw those down into the bone and take it out and then we can pass these stitches up through the tendon and that's what ties it back down. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that the, the little screws are into the bone right here. The stitches are passed up through this tissue and when you tie those stitches, they'll tie right down to the bone. And here's those same stitches now tied and you can't see the hole anymore. It's tied right down to the bone. And again, that's the same slim for six weeks. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So here, let's see what this, this video is uh, maybe going to go. So this, is, so this is a repair of the rotator cuff. So he's got a little shaver again where he's cleaning up the tissue where it attaches to the bone. So this is where it should attach to the bone. I can't really tell from where I'm standing and how clear that is. I guess that's pretty good. And then you can see there's soft tissue up above that shaver that should be attached right where the shaver is. So he's taken all the extra soft tissue off the bone so there's as good blood supply as there can be. Then this is a little punch that pokes a hole in the bone. And then into that hole, here goes a screw. This one's actually made of metal rather than plastic. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, that was the tap. And then here's the, here's the anchor going. And this one is one that's made out of what's called biocomposite material that over time, the body actually reabsorbs that and turns it into bone. It sort of gets replaced by bone, at least in theory. So the anchors go in and then they'll pull those me the metal sheath away and there will be stitches there. And then there's bunches of different ways to pass those stitches. He's got this little hook that he passes through the rotator cuff, so he's in the tear right there. He hooks the rotator cuff and pulls that stitch up through the rotator cuff. And he's going to pass all those stitches that way and get a whole row of them that are through the rotator cuff. Is the rotator cuff one solid piece or is it a, a bunch of tendons? It starts out as four muscles and then as they come out to the edge, they all overlap one another and, in, and are interwoven. So it ends up being one sort of sheet of tissue even though it starts out immediately as four different muscles. So it's a little hook that he's using. So the cannula, so we're, we pump fluid into the shoulder and that's what it gives us this space to be able to see. And we use these plastic cannulas that go through the muscle in order to give us a port where we can get our instruments in and out. So the instruments go down through this rubber gasket inside the shoulder and then here you can see he can tie knots by, put, by using this little pusher that goes down through the cannula and all those instruments all go down through the cannula. And then that's what you're left with is those, those knots that are holding that rotator cuff in place. And then this is showing smoothing off the bone spurs on the, out, on the underside of that acromion bone. We have a thing that's like a little Dremel tool called a burr that we smooth that, smooth that off with and to give the rotator that cuff just more takes room. The material that protrudes, it doesn't want to it can, it, can take, uh, it can take too much. The idea is to try to take the undersurface of that bone, if it has a hook on the front, it's going to push on the rotator cuff. So the idea is to try to flatten the hook that's up in front so that you end up with a nice flat bone that won't push down on the rotator cuff. And then maybe one last thing that's worth looking at is just the frozen shoulder. So this again just shows that that, that um, capsule is all inflamed. So all those ligaments are all inflamed and making it hard for the shoulder to move. And when you look at it inside the shoulder, this is those ligaments. So this is inside the shoulder, the cup of the shoulders down here. And all this red is just really inflamed red angry tissue. So um, this is a relatively uncommon thing to need to do, but you can go in. So this is now the ball of the shoulder joint up here the cup of the shoulder joints down there. That's one of those shavers. And what they're going to do here is literally take a little pair of scissors that's through one of these cannulas and just cut the ligaments all the way around in order to try to get the shoulder moving. Don't they have to be attached again? Yeah, but in this situation where it's, it's that's a good question. Do they need to be attached again? We all, in young people, we end up repairing these ligaments all the time because it's horrible for them to be detached. Yet for some reason, when you get this problem, your shoulder is so inflamed that you can detach them and they tend to heal back and people don't end up with instability of their shoulder. Um, in fact, 
you probably get, you can probably count on getting about halfway between it. So if somebody can lift their arm up this high before you do it, you feel pretty good if at the end of, at the end of therapy, if they can get halfway between there and all the way up. But for people that don't want to wait, if you, there, there you can see the tear in the ligament between here and here. They've just cut that all the way through. So you can opt for that or you can opt to just let it rest and fix it up. You can do injections. What I find is that for most people, doing a cortisone injection inside the shoulder joint and doing some stretching, for most people, if you catch it early enough, kind of stops it and gets it to a point where maybe they don't have full motion, but they have functional motion and they don't have too much pain. And then you wait it out for a while for it to come back to being fully normal, but it's at least functional and tolerable. So that right there was an adhesive capsulitis. That was a release? That was a release. So they, you just cut it free. Fortunately, we don't do that. That's not a very common operation. So, it's, so I'm showing you it. At the, that rotator cuff repair, um, I do, I don't know, two, three, four a week, something like that. The, this capsular release, I do one every 18 months. It's just not anywhere near as common. When, it's indicated when somebody has adhesive capsulitis that's painful, is not getting better, and they just can't, they can't, they can't tolerate it. They can't function. They want to be doing, you know, if you have somebody who wants to play tennis and their shoulder won't move, and you say, that's okay, you can play tennis in two years. People aren't all that enthusiastic about that as an answer usually. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that that's... Any, anybody have anything that they wanted to see that they didn't or that they wanted to hear about that they didn't? Yeah. Trouble reaching, like, from the passenger side reaching back. And I read that that rotator cuff also is part of it. Is that, that, that can be. So re reaching back, like, people, people often talk about trying to reach behind to get something out of the back seat or reaching back for the seat belt. And, that position, just like reaching behind your back to do your bra or whatever, that's sort of a similar position that puts you, brings your rotator cuff up against that acromion bone. So um, that's actually a relatively common thing that people talk about. But that can also be adhe that can also be some mild stiffness in your shoulder. So when your shoulder gets stiff, it hurts too. So it could be just that your shoulder doesn't want to go there because the ligaments have tightened up. So there's the shoulder has so many things that can cause pain, and it's and and so many different reasons for those things to cause pain that. You know, it requires a little bit of sorting out usually. Yes? I have a question about the muscles in the arm. You raise your arm like this, mm -hmm. you don't have any pain, but if you turn your arm up, you try it. There's a different pain, different muscles that control There's different, different muscles that have different functions depending on what position your arm's in. And the other thing is that the tension on those muscles is different. So, for instance, your biceps tendon has different tension on what the test for, for one of the tests for biceps problems hurts when you're like this, but doesn't hurt when you're like this. And it's just because of the way that biceps is stretched around the ball, the shoulder joint. But the same thing's true with your rotator cuff. Diff there are different, different muscles are doing different things depending on what position your arm's in. I think it's a great idea if you have somebody that knows how to do it. So um, it really is mostly for feedback is what, it's, is what it's mostly for, is to give you a sense of where your shoulder is in space. And, I, and it can be helpful for sure. And then we didn't, so we didn't really talk, let me just, I know we're a little bit late. Let me just spend two minutes talking about exercises because that's something that you asked about. And I had a bunch of videos of exercises, but that would take another 20 minutes to go through that. But so, so the things you want to strengthen in your shoulder is you want to strengthen the muscles that support your shoulder blade. When people go to the gym and work out, they tend to do exercises that strengthen your chest muscles and not exercises that strengthen your back muscles. So you want to focus on doing rows and those sorts of things that strengthen the muscles around your shoulder blade. Um, doing push-ups, just even against the wall push-ups where you're really using your shoulder blade more than using your arms to try to get the muscles around your shoulder blade strengthened up. And then the other ones are, are strengthening the muscles that rotate in and the muscles that rotate out. And you can do that at the gym using the universal machine with, with light weight so that you're doing 15 reps in and out. You can do that with a TheraBand or rubber band that you get at, the, you know, at Walgreens or whatever that you attach to the wall and then you stand and pull that rubber band in and pull that rubber band out. 
And you can also do it with weight. So you can, the same, rather than pulling the rubber band this way, you can lie on your side, put a towel under your arm, and take a can of soup or a little one pound, you know, one pound dumbbell, and you lie on your side and lift your arm up this way, and that strengthens your external rotators. And then you lie on your back and just bring it in toward the middle, and that strengthens the internal rotators. So those are really the, the sort of the big things to work on strengthening around your shoulder. Anyone else? Thanks. Thank you. What would be inflammatory that you recommend that you see a lot of patients get really from? What? Anti-inflammatory medicine. So, so the over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medicines are Aleve, Aleve. Or, which is Naproxen. So Naproxen and Aleve are the same thing. And Ibuprofen, which is Advil, Motrin, Ibuprofen are the same thing. So those are both anti-inflammatory medicines, whereas um, Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, is a pain medicine, but not, a, not an anti-inflammatory medicine. The thing about those things as anti-inflammatories is that um, if you take them just as one dose, it works as a pain reliever, but not really as an anti-inflammatory medicine. So to get the anti-inflammatory effect, you have to take it kind of consistently. Um, so Aleve, you have to take the prescription dose for naproxen would be two Aleves twice a day, or over the counter would be one Aleve twice a day, and you do that over a period of a couple or a couple or three weeks, something like that. There's some thought after, I don't know whether you guys remember, if Vioxx was an anti-inflammatory it was a, that turned out to have heart issues. We now understand that most anti-inflammatories probably cause an increased risk of heart problems. So, um, so well, people used to be on anti-inflammatories for years, probably three weeks or a couple weeks is reasonable. Yeah, get, get, use it, get the anti-inflammatory effect and move on. Thank you. Cool, thank you.